What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we're talking about training volumes. Specifically, do super high volumes produce super results? But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment for the algorithm. There was a recent study published that has gotten a lot of attention on social media. And in fact, it's funny, I've seen uh, Minnow Henselman's post about it. I've seen my friend Dr. Pack post about it. I've seen Milo Wolf Coach post about it. And at the bottom of the commentary is, people are gonna lose their minds in the comments. And unshockingly, people lose their minds in the comments. And I'm sure people are gonna lose their minds in the comments here. But just remember, I'm gonna try and give you as unbiased, uh, breakdown of the study as I can, how it fits in the context of the overall data, and what caveats there may be. This study was essentially looking at different weekly progressions in training volume and how they affected strength and muscle mass. But first, we gotta go back. And let's talk about my bias here, because I do have a bias. And this is one of the things that really upsets me or annoys me, people who say, well, I don't have a bias. Yes, you have a bias because you have a personal experience. Biases are fine. What's important is to be honest about your bias. I have been training for 25 years. My best results, be it strength or hypertrophy, and for catching up my legs, which were a very weak point for me in bodybuilding for a long time, all came through the use of high volume training. And when I say that, especially to get my legs to grow from about 2006 to 2010, from when I won my pro card in natural bodybuilding to when I competed as a pro, I made big improvements in my lower body that were very noticeable and many of the judges actually came up and asked what I did. On average, my weekly amount of sets was probably around 30 for quadriceps and probably around 15 to 20 for hamstrings and around 30 for calves. Now, I didn't have the best legs on stage, but they went from being very, very toothpick-like to respectable. Most of those sets were taken close to failure uh, within a few reps, and I did have longer rest periods. Now, I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. And then when I was training for powerlifting, when I competed in 2014 nationals, 2015 nationals, 2015 Arnold Classic and the 2015 IPF Worlds where I set a then, at the time, world squat record of 668 pounds in the 205 pound class, my squat volume was very high. And I went from, you know, what I thought was my top end squat of about 600 pounds. I always, when I was squatting low fives, mid fives, I thought maybe one day I could hit a 600 to a level that I didn't think was possible for me that really, the only thing that limited me was I got injured. I think I would have still continued to progress if I hadn't gotten injured. And especially before Worlds, my weekly squat volume was in excess of 25 sets per week. And the lightest weight I touched for those four weeks before Worlds was about 510 pounds. So very heavy, very intense, and a lot of sets. That is my personal bias. I saw great results with higher volume, high weekly set numbers. Now, when we talk about volume, there's a few different ways to clarify. You have uh, what's called volume load, which is simply the weight times the reps times the sets. That used to be the old way of quantifying volume, and now we've kind of moved more towards what we call weekly number of sets, or weekly number of hard sets, which essentially are the number of sets that get within a few reps of failure on a weekly basis, because uh, if you're doing lighter weight for higher reps, you will have a higher volume load because you're doing so many reps with a certain amount of weight, but the intensity may not be there. For example, if you did a set of 10 with 135 pounds on squat, that is 1,350 pounds of volume, or you could have done 300 pounds for three reps, that's 900 pounds of volume, but the 300 by three may be close to failure, whereas the 135 by 10 wasn't even close. So when we're talking about equating volume, the best metric we have for this that we think right now is number of weekly hard sets. Okay, so there's those quantifiers out of the way. There's my personal bias out of the way. What did this study examine? So this study was a 12-week study where they started people out at 10 sets per week. So six different times. Every two weeks, they increased the set number by either two, four, or six 
sets. With the top number of sets in the high volume group at the end being 52 sets per week, okay? Each set was taken to two RIR, which is two reps in reserves, meaning it was supposed to be two reps shy of failure, and they rested for two minutes between each set, and they took the last set of each exercise to failure. What did they find? Well, what they found was that in terms of strength, interestingly, there appeared to be a dose response, and there were statistically significant differences between the low and moderate volume group and then the moderate to high volume group in terms of the set number increases. So they saw the most strength increase in the highest volume group, the second most in the second highest volume group, and the least strength increase in the two sets progression group. What did they find for muscle thickness? Well, they didn't find statistically significant differences between groups, but the p-values were really close. So the p-values were P of like 0.06 to 0.07 or 0.08. Now, why is that important? Your p-value is essentially a marker of whether or not something is statistically significant. Now, in statistical speak, p-values of less than 0.05 are considered statistically significant. Now, what does that actually mean? That there's less than a 5% chance that the null hypothesis is true. That is the straight down the line statistical representation of that definition. For our lay purposes, and my statisticians out there will cringe when I say this, so my apologies in advance, but for the lay person, a p-value of 0.05 essentially means that there is less than a 5% chance the differences we see between groups were due to random chance. And so there's an over 95% chance that they were due to the treatment effect. P-value of 0 0.06, 0 0.07, 0 0.08, okay, well there's a, a 92, 93, 94% chance that it wasn't due to random chance. Again, you have to have a cutoff somewhere to call something statistically significant. Statisticians will get really into the weeds about whether or not they're hardliners on the point, you know, P of 0.05. Other people will kind of look at it on the spectrum. The point is, when they look at it, it appears to be a dose response. And it fits with the strength data, and it's important to point out, muscle thickness is a lot more noisy of a measurement, and if they didn't have so much variance in the measure, they probably would have seen statistical differences, or if they'd had more people. People in the comments on social media have been losing their minds over this study. And they said, there's no way people can train hard 52 sets per week. Dial it back. First off, realize it was only 52 sets per week by the end of the study. I've done training increases where, like for example, I'm hitting over 30 sets of squats per week. But I didn't start the training block that way. I started closer to like 10 or 15 sets. So you get up to a peak and then usually you've got a taper because your recovery becomes impaired. This was 52 sets by the end. It was not 52 sets throughout the entire duration. That's important to point out. They standardized them to a two RIR. If they were in fact doing two RIR, they were getting close to failure. They were getting close enough to failure to consider these intense sets. People can be notoriously bad at estimating their RIR. There's a lot of data on this. But they did have them take each set of the last exercise to failure. They only rested two minutes between sets. And some people have said, well, that's not enough time to recover. They would have had to use less and less weight. That may be true. But the point is, if you're getting close enough to failure, even if they're using less weight throughout the entirety of the sets, it's still intense enough to be a hard set. The proximity to failure is what seems to matter for muscle growth. Now, when we put this together, how does this fit with some other data? Well, there's several other systematic reviews and meta-analyses that point in the same direction. I'm thinking specifically about one uh, done by Dan Ogborn, uh, as well as Brad Schoenfeld in 2016, where they showed very similar effects going from, say, 10 sets a week to 20 sets a week to 30 sets a week, and even looking at uh, triceps growth, particularly, now, I'm not saying it's unique to triceps growth. It just happened to be the muscle that they had the highest set data on. They saw 27 to 45 weekly sets was better than like 20 to 25 weekly sets. Sorry, I can't remember the exact number. The point being, when you go from an already high number of weekly sets to a higher number of weekly sets, it appears to still have a growth effect. Furthermore, when they examine like low responders to muscle growth in studies versus high responders, you almost always get more high responders in the higher set number groups 
and you almost always get more low responders in the low set number groups. There are some other studies, uh, I'm thinking of one recently in particular, where they looked at different set numbers, low volume and high, and didn't find differences in muscle growth or strength between them. But this study in particular went back and assessed, we have some people in this low volume group. What if this is actually high volume for them? What if they've been doing real low volume before this? And what if the high volume people, some of them are actually doing lower volumes than they're used to? Because there's a thought that it's not necessarily the absolute volume you're doing, but it's the volume versus what you used to be doing. Think progressive overload. And so when they stratified people based on that, they actually did see that there was a tendency for people to get more muscle when they were increasing their volume versus people who decreased their volume did not get as big of a response. Then if you look at more like molecular type data, so we have data in rats where they look at number of sets of contractions versus when muscle protein synthesis peaks and they find that about in a session, eight to 12 sets per session maxes out muscle protein synthesis. Then if you look at similar data in humans, it's actually interesting when you look at resting less than two minutes, maximum anabolic set number appears to kind of keep increasing. So, you know, 10, even 15 sets in a session. But when you rest more than a few minutes between sets, there looks to be, based on the formulas used, this was an analysis done by James Krieger, there's a pretty pronounced upswing to six sets and then it plateaus. What that seems to possibly suggest is that when you take more rest between sets, you make each set more potent on a per set basis. And so perhaps your set cap is lower in terms of anabolism. So again, remember this study was doing two minutes of rest right on that borderline. Perhaps if they had rested longer between sets, we would have seen different results. Perhaps there wouldn't have been differences between the high and moderate group. We don't know. What appears to be the case, if we take this all together, is that very rarely is higher volume worse for muscle growth. We don't consistently see that. What we consistently see is higher volume appears to be as good and possibly better than lower volumes. What does that mean for you, an individual? No, I don't think everybody should be doing 52 sets a week. And keep in mind, a lot of these were some isolation movements, some non, these aren't 52 sets of squats per week. So the considerations are, if you've been making progress on a low set number, it probably doesn't make sense to drastically jump up your volume because you just don't need to. Once you start to plateau, you can add a few sets, get over that plateau, and then use it just like you would a dose response. Or perhaps another example is if you're dieting down and you're losing body fat and you hit a fat loss plateau, then you can drop calories, increase your activity to get past that plateau. But if you are losing fat really well, there's no reason to add more cardio or take away calories because you simply don't need to. And that's what I would suggest when it comes to volume, don't just jack your volume way up because you think you're gonna get swole overnight. Building muscle still takes a lot of time. Bring it up in a progressive manner and consider that also too, at a certain point, your time is being impeded. When I was training with these crazy high volumes, my lifting sessions were anywhere from two to four hours a session. I mean, these were long sessions. Most people can't do that sort of thing. Those of us who have real jobs are not able to do that. Fortunately, I kind of have a, not a real job, so I can do that if I want to. But for most people, that's a big consideration. Finally, there is the recovery aspect of things. When I was younger, I could tolerate some of these higher set volumes because I could really prioritize my recovery. My stress was much lower. Uh, I was sleeping more. Now, being an entrepreneur with you know four different businesses and two kids, it, it's a lot tougher for me to move these puzzle pieces into a place where I can prioritize that recovery as much. And what I have consistently found is at this stage of my lifting career, if I try to do those kinds of volumes, I just invariably get injured and deal with a lot of pain. You have to look at it as what are the goals now, again, if I was bodybuilding and not powerlifting, I can do more volume with movements that don't cause me pain. I have more ways to skin a cat. I can do more leg extensions. I can do more belt squats. I, there's many ways for me to skin a cat. But as a powerlifter, I have to do a certain amount 
of squatting, bench pressing, and deadlifting if I want to get better at those things. I'm not saying this is the end all be all study, but people out there who are just dismissing this as all, oh, well, this is a garbage study, said by everyone with no research experience who just doesn't like the results. I mean, there were some really great things about this study. Uh, one of them being is they were resistance trained men with five years of experience in resistance training, most of whom could squat over three plates to depth. I mean, that is not an easy thing to find. Now, I think Instagram makes us believe that we can just go find, you know, these massive squatters anywhere, but think about it really at your gym. How many people can squat three plates legitimately below parallel? Probably less than 5% of the dudes that go there. There were some really great aspects of this study. Is it the end all be all? No, if you inject me with true serum and ask me what do I think the relationship between volume and growth is, I think it is a positive relationship. Volume tolerances and thresholds are probably individual and need to be tailored to the individual. And I do think that there probably is a limit to the volume that's beneficial to an individual. And it can be based on many things your overall recovery, how much rest you take between sets, perhaps the exercise. Maybe different exercises don't have the same impact on muscle protein synthesis or tax your recovery as much. So there's a lot of things that are wrapped up in this. And what I will say is 15 years ago, these sorts of studies and this kind of research didn't really exist. We were asking really rudimentary questions. I have seen the resistance training research literature progress to the point where we're actually starting to get some idea of answers to some of these more nuanced questions. And I think in the next 10 years, we're gonna see an absolute explosion in data that's really gonna help us nail down some of these questions that we've had for a long time. But in general, I do think higher volume appears to be better than lower volume, all things being equal for muscle growth and for strength. But in order to tease out the really specific implications of that, we just need more research. If you guys are like, blah, 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 how do I get jacked? Great question. What I recommend is go sign up for the BioLane Workout Builder. There you can find all of our evidence-based workout programs. We have programs for every level, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, advanced. We also have specialty programs that focus on various different body parts or different styles of training so that you can pick what fits best for you. We take care of all the messy guesswork of your sets, your reps, your intensity, but we give you the flexibility to choose exercises that you prefer and have access to. So make sure you click the link to the workout builder, sign up for that and get jacked. Catch you guys next week.